from a historical standpoint, the whole idea of the rocket stove developed some years ago. Uh, I'm not quite sure of, uh, of exactly what years, in the 80s maybe, something like that. There's actually a, a, a Welsh, a guy from Wales, and he had gone, uh, made an effort with some other people to resolve the issue in developing countries, which is, a, which is actually a very, very concerning issue. Many, many families in developing countries in Central America, Africa, and other places have their cooking facilities, the stove is an open fire in the middle of a, a very small hut or building or whatever. And it creates an incredibly bad health condition for both the, the cook, who gets the brunt of it, which is always the woman of the family, and, and the children and, the, and anybody else who's living in the household. So, um, Ianto Evans, this is Welsh gentleman, he and uh, many other people, it's like, it's, he's the one that stands out because he, he took it and developed it further, but, but they were working on projects in Guatemala, I believe, where they were doing what they call a Lorena stove, which is basically a, a homemade or owner-made uh, stove made of earth, earthen clay and sand, just like we have here, and uh, using a principle which, is, which had been developed over time, but using the principle which was basically the precursor to the rocket principle. So you can see, this is just wood storage here. This is the uh, feed tube, and, and the, the burning occurs in here, and then the chimneys, there's two, there's two exits. This, this does not, in, in this particular one, the, the, the heat's just coming up through those two grates, and um, the, the fire is burning horizontally, so it does help to combust a lot of that residual material that would normally be a health hazard. Particulates, gases, uh, the steam is full of, a, full of chemicals because it hasn't been, had a chance to burn out, but in a stove like this, it will give the opportunity to burn a, a considerable amount of that, of that material out of the, of the fire. So that's just, that's a typical example of the original, one of the original Lorena stoves. Um, other ones, have um, in, a, in a more sophisticated design, which actually are, uh, is much more common now, the, the channel here is separated so the flame and heat, the flame does not come up through those grates. It actually goes, continues out and goes up a little flue stack in the back. So you have uh, just heat coming up through these two units. And they're usually referred to as, as two pot stoves and they'll actually, the, the, it'll be a kit that comes with with the metal it takes to support the pots and the two pots which actually fit into very specifically rounded holes that just sit in there and that heat just passes underneath it but, but the smoke doesn't come up around those pots, it just comes past them and then goes out the, uh, out the flue stack. So that's basically what, um, you know, what that is. This, this is the, the example. You've got your air, in this case, a horizontal feed where the wood goes in the, the burn is horizontal and, and also some vertical, and then it hits the, uh, the pot chamber, which is sealed up here and there. Okay, so there's your um, seal right there, and the smoke exits right out the flue, and that's it. The mass of the stove also keeps uh, everything warm, I mean, that, that, will, that will stay, after the fire's out, that will stay warm for quite a while, actually physically warm around it to keep you comfortable in cooler weather. And it also keeps the pots warm uh, in the insulated area up there to, um, you know, keep the food cooking. So it's, it's actually a very nice compact and much bigger improvement over just an open fire in, in a uh, house. So this is sort of an example, very close to but not exactly what will be, what the finished product will look like here. Probably not with the stonework in this area up here, maybe not, but you know, stone at the bottom and a lot of uh, cob around the, the back and the walls, you know, be about at least six inches thick in the back here and the side, and then there'll be a bench of maybe about knee height um, at this, about what, about what that is there, that concrete. So uh, that's basically what it looked like without all the accoutrements and whatever. But you can see the barrel or the bell is going to be located right in the middle of that pad there. This is uh, just a drawing, but I mean this is basically, when you think, I want, I want to give you examples of different designs of, uh, 
of how the rocket mass heater can be designed and used. That's a nice little small, compact, comfortable looking, um, you know, it's a little tile inset around it. Uh, you know, it's a drawing, but still that's a, that's a nice example of what people might think of as a, as a rocket mass heater. I mean, it's very cozy. Um, this is also a, a rocket heater. It's not a, ma a rocket mass heater, but it's a rocket heater. You've got your fire feed tube in the front there where the flame, in front of that flame, where the, where the sticks and the fuel are being fed vertically into the, into the hole. The flame path travels horizontally, and then the flue gases exit up that back tall flue, and they've got something warming or uh, cooking on there. Because it's a short little flue, there is heat up there at the top. If it was the rocket mass heater, by the time it came out of the exit flue, the temperature might only be 200 degrees, much, much less than, than a wood stove where you might have a 400 to 450 degree temperature at that point. So this is a very simple example of one. Um, there's another one. Uh, this one's made of brick. Um, essentially the same thing. You've got, you can actually see the rockety effect of it. You've got, you've got a horizontal fuel feed, horizontal burn, and then in this case it's coming right around and also burning you know, straight up. And it will occur like that too in, in these units uh, when the wood's dry and when you're, when you're at the height of its burning. Uh, it'll do that too, but we won't see that because there's a barrel over it. Um, here's just a day bed, you know, again, your barrels here. Um, it's painted black to help uh, radiate them. It's just a, a simple black barrel. Uh, the exit flue's there and in, inside there, you can't really see it, of course, it's covered, but, but in there is all crisscrosses with uh, ductwork underneath. It's generally closer to the ground. It, the ductwork doesn't normally, you don't usually set it up higher. You usually keep it down low. Uh, there's another example that's sort of a narrow mass, little uh, bench with um, not, a, not a lying down bench, but just a seating bench. So it doesn't take up so much space, but it does, still does have a lot of mass. Um, the barrel in this example is not um, exposed that much, so the mass is getting more uh, heat absorption. I've often been curious about that just because you know, we have a lot of kids running around our facility and uh, it just seems like a fire hazard to have a steel bar barrel getting super hot. Whereas um, to put cob on it or to put things over it, it's not going to change any. Yeah, well putting things over it is going to change. I mean, it, in this case, um, they've exposed the metal in a very small amount, very limited exposure on the metal. So the mass, that mass is not going to be um, dangerously hot, maybe at the very top edge. My question is, is there any negative impact to covering the metal? Yes, it's not going to ooze, it's not going to radiate heat if you cover it. You could put a wire around it, you could, put, you could have the barrel and then, and then uh, design it so that you have maybe a four inch uh, or six inch barrier of screen, uh, say hardware cloth, around there so nobody can actually reach through and touch the barrel. You know, you could do that. It'll still radiate. Yeah, it'll still radiate right past the, right past the wire. But if you covered it with, say, a, um, a ring of another piece of steel, you're not, going to get, you're not going to get that radiation feeling standing next to it like this. Uh, if it's uncovered and I've got half the barrel exposed, I'm going to feel it, obviously, just like a wood stove. If you put another second ring around that and to protect your kids from touching the barrel, you, you're not going to get that feel. You, the, it's going to get warm. Is that, that, it'll take longer for the cob to heat up, yes. but it'll radiate for it'll radiate, it will be the temperature. It will not be a temperature at which you're going to burn yourself touching it. Right. It's a stainless steel bell. Barrels will burn out uh, over time, and you know, that's actually a part of the deal. You, have to, you may have to replace the, the barrel. Um, in our case, we've designed it so that we can actually unsnap it, take the barrel off, and just put a new barrel on and snap it back in place, uh, a new one. And the stainless steel barrels last, you know, a, considerably a lot longer. They're harder to cut and all that, but they, um, they last a lot longer. On, on the other hand, they're also expensive. Uh, the cheapest one I could find was 100, about $110. Um, normally they go about $400 to $450 new. Um, not worth it. Uh, I mean, it, uh, unless you had the money to spend, it's really not worth it to spend, to put that kind of money into the, the bell. You could find options like water tanks, old, just old tanks from 
industry or whatever at the scrap yard that would be the right size that you could easily pick up that would be much thicker steel uh, and would take a much longer time to burn out. Um, you could find them, you know, for probably 30 or 40 dollars and not worry about stainless. But if there's a source of stainless and you can get it cheap, okay, great. What's the average age of a uh, regular steel barrel before it burns out on you? Oh, you might, yeah, you might. Um, I wouldn't be surprised that if you used, in a northern environment, if you used it, if you used it, uh, you know, gung-ho every day and just kept at it, it might, it might have to be replaced at the end of the season. Um, normally a couple of years, though, yeah. Uh, you know how uh, uh, bullet heaters that you have, space heaters, have like a, uh, uh, a baffle? You, know, again. you mean you mean like a ra you a, a, ra a hydronic radiator baseboard or do you mean a space heater? Space heater. Okay. Uh, would it be possible to put a baffle inside the the bell uh -huh. to uh, diffuse that heat? Otherwise, isn't that top going to wear out? Oh, okay. Or, it's all part of the design. Uh, a, a baffle or anything inside is going to is going to destroy the flow of the um, of the gases. And I'll I'll show you when we get to the that image. Uh, the inside is very specific about how much clearance there is between the top of the heat riser and the bottom of the barrel. Um, it, with, these snap, with these snap lock barrels it's very easy to, we don't even have to worry about the top of the barrel. The barrel is $26. New. I think, I think we paid $26 for that. Um, the, uh, you unsnap, and I'll show you, unsnap the ring, lift the barrel off, use it for something else, you know, and then put a new one right on there and snap it and that's it. So it's not a, you know, not a Big deal. Here's a white plaster one. I'm going to plaster a Paris finish on it, and it looks pretty good. It looks like it's inside of a yurt, maybe. How, how hot to touch do those barrels get, would you say? Barrel can be uh, 200 degrees. Um, the, the, the surface of the cob will be about 90 or so. You know, it can, it's, it's nice. I mean, it'll go down, too. It can get down to 70 or 65, whatever. But depending on the length of the cycle, but um, uh, like if you, if you burn for say three hours, then, then you don't burn anymore. Uh, by the end of 24 hours, that cob surface is gonna be still warm, but it's not gonna be 90 degrees. It's gonna be down you know, at a much lower temperature, but it's still comfortably warm. That's a, uh, actually another one in a yurt. A lot, a lot of times these, these units are not put up against a wall, but they can be right in the center of the uh, room. And, uh, in a yurt, of course, this, this sort of sticks out. You can see, obviously, the um, ductwork must go under that uh, bench in the back against the wall and come back again and then go out, you know, go out the chimney or out the uh, exit flue. But, um, you know, that's just another example of how big they can get. Uh, there's a traditional bench style, um, you know, sort of compact, you know, not, not very colorful or whatever, but it's a, you know, you can sculpt this cob very easily. I mean, it's, not, it's not that difficult to form it, shape it, and, and dress it. Uh, there's a nice little one. That, one's, that particular one's on a wood floor, which requires a lot of, not a whole lot, but uh, requires some definite attention uh, to insulation underneath and also over a crawl space. Most wood floors are not going to be on a concrete floor, so they'll be on a joisted crawl space or, or a basement maybe. Uh, it is definitely a requirement with a 5,000 pound, our unit here is going to be about 5,000 pounds by the end of the project. Uh, you have to get up under there and, and uh, peer it up or, or uh, you know, jack it up with, uh, with piers to help support all that weight. So that's a, you know, generally people try to discourage construction on a, wood, on a wooden floor or a, or a joisted floor, but it can be done. It has been done quite a bit. Sometimes they'll put um, channels underneath so that the heat has a chance to get out. Like every, every foot or every 16 inches, there might be a little channel from front to back to help, help dissipate some of that heat out. Um, I didn't want to do that here because, you know, we probably have mice in here or whatever. I didn't want, I didn't want to get, um, in the winter especially, have nests and, you know, insects and stuff being in there. So we just won't worry about that. There's another, I don't, I don't know where this came from, as a, uh, but it's just a really uh, nice example of a sculpted, um, you know, sculpted example. Firewood storage, if you notice, a lot of these have the firewood storage right built in because that will guarantee you, if you keep it full, 
that'll guarantee you that the wood's going to be really nice and dry um, before it goes into the stove. So if you keep that replenished, if you put, you know, you put a handful into the stove and replace it into the dryer, um, that means you don't have to go out, trips out to the woodshed or out the front porch to get the wood. It's all right there and it's always dry. Uh, this is just a hot water heater. It's a UK, as a, I, I, somewhere in England, uh, they call them geysers. They call a hot water heater a geyser. So the guy has built a, um, basically incorporated a rocket heater into his hot water cylinder, which is stainless steel, uh, and um, because of the heat involved, and he didn't want to have to dissemble it, you know, replace the metal all the time. The stainless steel will last, you know, a long, long time. So that's like a stainless steel barrel on top of the bell? Yeah. What, actually, what it is, it's a, the flue goes through the center, and he's got the top of the barrel part is right there. In other words, it goes up, and, and, and the, it exits out there, and the whole thing's insulated. So he's... Uh, um, just heating his water with that, and it's out. You know, it's outside. So here's what I was trying to show you: the wood goes in. This is the this is the uh, feed tube. This is the burn chamber. That's the heat riser. So, and then, as the wood burns, it drops because it's it's being stuck in vertically. It it just it burns and it sort of just settles into the hole. And as it burns, the because the direction of burn is wanting to go out the heat riser, the flame actually occurs horizontally. And then, of course, some, you know, in, in the, at the height of the burning period, it'll, it'll come up, you know, up here too. But um, all the burn gases, the heat, and all the, the steam, has, all that's been pretty much burned as efficiently as it can. You, about 90%, like a wood stove, you know, a regular old fire, uh, what do you call them, just trash burner, old style wood stove is probably somewhere between 65 and 70 something percent efficient, which is not very good. A modern, a modern um, uh, catalytic or, or approved high tech wood stove, which you buy at the store new today, is gonna run you know, somewhere in the, in the high 70, 78, 80, 82 um, percent. And uh, these will actually get to, I mean, a well-designed one, a correctly designed one, will, will be about 90% efficient. So you're going to burn, if, if not more, you're going to burn, um, you know, almost every bit of wood you put in there is going to get used. The heat is actually going to get used instead of being sent out the chimney. As I said, these temperatures, um, you know, the exit flue, the temperature might only be about 200 degrees out the top, and that's really not very much. Um, so the flame pattern, the heat pattern is, it goes up here like this, hits the top of that barrel, and that barrel is placed very specifically over a square or round heat riser so that you have clearance of about three inches around, all around the, the heat riser, and about two to three inches at the top between, the, between that top of that heat riser and the, that steel barrel. So the path goes up, the hot gases go out and then on, on its way out through the serpentine and out the, out the flue. So for that draft to get started rather than burning straight up, mm -hmm. is that all dependent on the space at the top there? Um, the space at the top is, is more, yeah, yes, that's part of it, but it's not the most important part. The closer to the heat riser that you put that barrel, the more effective the heating surface is going to be, like a cooking surface. So you have to think about this before you design it. Like we probably don't need a, a good cooking surface on here. We'd probably be much happier with, with heat just oozing out the side of the barrel and, and you know, the top. When you put it down closer to two inches, then you've dedicated the top to a much hotter surface. When you lift it up, you're, you're spreading that heat around, not only on the top surface, but around the outside too. And so you're stealing the heat that normally would be at the top and you're giving it to the, to the sides. That's when you pick it up. Sometimes people, before all the engineering was done and people actually have built you know, hundreds of these things, it was very common for people to actually build the unit in the house, open all the windows, um, and get a couple of people, start the fire going, and get a couple of people and, get that bar and put the barrel over the top of it and, and just hold it with, with welder's gloves and just hold it until you could hear the rockety It'll, it'll whoosh, you know, it'll be, it'll still burn, it'll be fine, but it'll, it'll burn and then you pick it up a little bit and it'll start to roar 
and then you pick it up all the way more, and, it, and it, the roar goes away. It's almost like tuning a radio, and you'll, you'll get right to the sweet spot where you want it, and that's, and that's where they set it. And they, they'll uh, shim it, and it has to be level, and then put the mud, you know, then the fire, let the fire burn out and put the mud, put the mason uh, mud all around and seal everything up. And that's, um, you know, we don't need to do that anymore, but people still do it. Uh, uh, just because they want to hear that, they want to make sure they got it in the right spot. The other trick is you can also take the barrel, and in our case, I'll probably do that. The more space you give the bell or the barrel, the more space you give it uh, off center. In other words, instead of having, you know, two and three quarters inches evenly exactly all around the the heat riser, if you scoot that barrel over a little bit and give the majority of it to the side that you want the heat to go out of. That's that's good. So you're you're stealing it from the narrow side and adding it to the to the wider side. And in this case, I, the wide, we don't want it in the back. Nobody's going to be back there. We don't want to give all the heat to the wall. So we're going to aim it more uh, either that way or you know maybe probably like that or maybe to the front. I, you know doesn't really matter. Um, probably more just towards towards that way. And uh, so we just scoot the barrel over just a little bit because you, you can't have you can't have the no airflow. You don't want no airflow on the back side. It, uh, you, you really want airflow around the whole unit, but you, it's okay to cheat a little bit and shove, you know, uh, make it two inches on the back side and, you know, almost four inches on the front side. This might be a little, I just like this one too because it was clear, because like, this has actually a cover on it and then the air can come in through the end, um, which sort of changes the dynamics of it a little bit. But I should mention these stoves are, are completely. Um, <clears throat> disassemblable. You, there are renters, people that get permission from landlords, is it okay if I build this stove in this house, I'm going to be here for two years or whatever. And yes, okay, we build it, when they go to move, take everything apart again, the mud is clay, it's not expensive. Let's take the stove pipe out, take the, you know, take the uh, bricks out, clean them off and just do, build it someplace else. Um, we may decide after we run, run it here for a while, may decide that maybe it is good to have a little lid on it and we can always adjust that. I mean, that may be something. I, I, can, see, I can see increasing the height of the um, feed tube a little bit, like that, I don't know if you can see that brick in the front, maybe, you know, it's gonna be at least that high, maybe a little taller. 12 inches on that, on that feed tube is about the minimum, uh, 15 or 16 is about the maximum. Also, you, you can put a cover on it, or a lid, or a door, or whatever, but that's not really the way it was designed to be. Normally, you do is you take a brick and use that as a, or even, a, even two bricks, and use that as a uh, draft control when, you, when you're starting it to, to gauge how much opening y you want. I mean, it's a seven inch wide by seven inch, seven and a half inch wide by seven inch deep rectangle. Uh, if you want to, if you don't, when you first start it, it may have a tendency for the smoke to come up out of the hole. You're lighting it like a campfire, so you might want to have to close that off a little bit and uh, try to get that fire to direct more horizontally and start going in the direction that um, it's supposed to go. That occurs much more commonly when it's cold, when it's first started and the bricks are cold, uh, when the combustion chamber is cold. Um, the way to resolve that, and we, I may or may not put this in, it's easy to do after, later, um, at a point either here where it transits from the cob to the exit flue, there would be a little um, T, a big T actually. This is easy, doesn't look very good, it's easy, but you get the idea, this is sealed, there's caps that fit in here. You actually can start, you can start the, um, initial, initially prime the fire for the, and start the direction of flow up the words the way it's supposed to go through a primer hole. You know, it could be down low if you could access it. It could be up a little higher, but, and it, it doesn't necessarily have to be this big. I mean, it can be smaller so you can get some uh, paper and, and uh, uh, a light in there. But basically that primer hole will, will start the flow in the right direction so that when you, um, when you first start your fire at the uh, feed tube here in the beginning, uh, it's not going to, uh, you know, back puff and just burn uh, like a campfire. You want it to go down the horizontal tunnel. Today is not a very good day for a good rocket stove because it's too warm out. Um, on a cold day, it, w it really wants to go out the, out the flue and suck in the, in the hole. This is the drum here. 
the bell. So it's going, you know, back into the um, horizontal tunnel and then up the heat riser. Uh, that's just a picture I found. It's a ca it's a um, a cast example of the heat riser. Um, there's the feed tube. There's the you know there's the uh, horizontal burn tunnel and there is the oops, there's the heat riser. And then the barrel fits right over that. It doesn't have to be a barrel, by the way. It doesn't have to be that big of, of a <coughs> barrel. Um, it can be a water tank. If you, if you take the cover off a of water, the metal, sheet metal white cover off a water tank, an electric water heater, the, the tank in there is usually smaller. It's usually taller and narrower. That'll work just fine. It's actually even thicker than, than these um, barrels. Yeah. Is it being circular um, imperative or connected? You know, it's not imperative, but I, I have looked I purposely look for a lot of pictures of um, non-circular, and it's, it's very hard to find them. Uh, it, a circle is just more um, conducive to the flow. It, it helps balance it a little better, and it's just, it's just easier to get circular drums and bells than it is square ones. I was just thinking, like, you see the old the stainless sinks that project out a lot? The stainless tanks they use for what? The industrial sinks that project out a lot? Yeah. And they're square. Yeah, but they're not that deep. Yeah, but they're not. That's, you need to have one that's like 48 inches. Now you could weld. You could probably get three of them and weld them together. Yeah, I mean that wouldn't. You know, not that it wouldn't work. It's just that I, I, I believe that it's just because the cylindrical barrels and drums are just so much more common. I mean, the inside will get. Uh, initially, in the original designs, the insides, they always wanted them round because the barrel was round. But now, and that's that's a good example right there. It's a, it's a perfectly round. Um, you know. Uh, mass. But you can also put more insulation. It may not be a perfect circle, but you can make it more or less a round shape by putting more insulation on the, on the flat parts, which we, we may do here, depending on how much you have. Um, not need four sides? Could it just go down one side? It has to have four sides. You know, three of the four sides can be, one can be a lot bigger and two can be less bigger and one can be very small, but it has to have, it has to have four um, all around. It has to, have, has to have access all around. It only comes out one side, but it has to be able to, it has to, be able to come down all around. That's just what you're seeing basically here, um, just an uh, example of, um, of setting up the, the uh, ducting before piling on the mass. And uh, they set, just, I use bricks here. We, we had set it up before on Thursday. I use bricks, but we, uh, they, you can use stone. I've got, I think I've used up all my bricks, so probably have to use stone. Um, a good flat stone. It's not critical. It, they do have to turn. They do have to um, turn up. Uh, you know, they have to go from from the start of the combustion chamber, from the actual exit at the bottom, what they call the manifold at the bottom of the bell. Uh, from that point on, the the angle has to always be upward slightly. It doesn't have to be a a, a very um, radical angle, but it has to be up. You know, slightly pitched. Um, I just found something here, just a picture of a, of a small bench set up, which is sort of similar to what we're doing today here, but, the, uh, but the, um, it's backwards. It's not, it's not backwards, it, it's, it's reversed. Uh, their, their drum and bell and everything is there, at, over there in that corner, and, uh, and they just have a two-duct system. I, I wanted at least a three-duct system, and even that's a little short, but we only have we only have available this space. I mean, I, really, I was originally going to build it over here, but where, I, where it would have been much longer and would have had uh, a good 25 or 30 feet of run. But um, that's the same thing. There's the setup, and that's, that's it when it's finished. Um, you know, based on the size of the pipe, uh, six inch and eight inch pipe, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain it later, you sort of go backwards from, from 50 feet and, and subtract based on the number of turns. But I'll, I'll explain that. There are two books that I, there's, uh, in your handouts here, you have, you have a good source of uh, resources, a good list of resources, many online, and there's these two books. Um, I would, I mean, I, I have both of them. I'd recommend both of them. Um, both of them are good. One, this one is the original uh, Iantos, um, and, and Leslie Jackson is a woman from uh, Oregon and, and San Francisco who does, who's helped them with a lot of the book publishing and all this stuff. And building and building many, many, many uh, cob stoves and cob homes on the West Coast. This is more of a 
less of a scientific book. I mean, it's, it's, it's easier, it's, it's smaller, it's easier to read, it's more experiential maybe. Um, uh, it is grounded in a lot of experience in, um, in some of the earlier designs. And then in this third edition includes, you know, more current pictures and more, um, more experiences they've had in constructing. So it's a, it's a really good book. I don't remember, I think it's about 20 bucks. Um, but, um, you know, it's a, that's the one book. And then the other book is just came out, I think, last uh, August, and it's the Rocket Mass Heater by uh, uh, Wisner's, Eric and uh, Ernie Wisner. Um, they're also from, I think they're from Oregon, I'm not positive, but they, uh, they have built hundreds, I believe, uh, hundreds and hundreds of these things in workshops and, and professionally for people and have done a lot of experimenting. I believe she may be a physicist or she has a good scientific background, but they, this is a much more, um, not just experiential, but also formulas and data and um, calculations you can do and examples of charts with, you know, if your burn hole is seven and a half by seven, then the ducting has to be, you know, this size and, you know, the, everything is, has been worked out. It's a bigger book, it's a more expensive book, um, but it's also, a really good book. Uh, you know, if you, I would suggest if you're serious about it, I'd probably get both books, but um, you can also get a lot of information online. They happen to have, uh, the Wisners, Ernie and Erica, have a, their own website. I think it's called Erica and Ernie, or Ernie and Erica. It's on, it's on the handout. Um, and they also collaborate with a group called um, the Permies, which is in Montana, I think, where it's a group of people doing a lot of alternative research on a lot of different things, but but biomass on, <laughs> online. Uh, and um, there's some other stuff I've put in there, just uh, uh, National Fire Protection Association has a, has a chart, has a lot of data on clearances from various combustible surfaces, what's safety to look at, you know, uh, wood, stone tile, you know, how far away from things should be, flu information, that kind of thing. So it's not particularly for rocket mass stoves, but just in general for wood burning appliances. So. Uh, thermal mass uh, electric generation, what do they call it, TEG or something like that? Yeah, um, something like this just really doesn't get hot enough to do that. I don't think it gets hot enough to really, to really, you know, get, get to that point. I don't think that would be a feasible thing. Um, it just doesn't, it doesn't, it's not really a, a high heating, a high temperature heating appliance. So, you know, it, it's, it's really just a, a human comfort appliance. I would imagine on a small scale, you could probably get biochar out of the um, residue from the, from the burn chamber. But see, biochar is mostly happens as a result of, um, of heating in the absence of oxygen. So we don't, in this situation, we almost always have oxygen. So it's really not, um, it might be okay to start the fire process with this, but I don't think this in itself is not going to be a good biochar generator in any volume because there's too much oxygen in, this, in the system. Because the, the biochar only works when, there's, when, when you've removed the oxygen from the equation and it just, it just uh, pyrolysizes. Anything else? No? Okay.